that's pretty good. Let's do that again. Good morning. Good morning. That's what I'm talking about. Let's act like the dogs are going to win Monday night. You know what I'm saying? Let's get that on going. Let's go. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I know. Pastor, I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I tell you what, I believe um, this is an awesome opportunity to come together and worship and just be together. And I am so, so thankful for it. Matter of fact, a lot of people say Pastor Matt and I look alike. And uh, I, I told him the truth. I was like, you know how good looking that makes me? I'm really thankful for that. Um, I was like, man, I really, that was really sweet of me. But then the lady just came up to me and she said, I thought Pastor Matt had actually grown taller. And I said, this is what Pastor Matt would look like if he was six foot tall. And uh, so, uh, so yeah, I was really appreciative. I came in early. They adjusted the lights for me. I appreciate that. I was, I mean, it was super nice. It was, it was really awesome. I was really, really thankful for that. And so, uh, so if I, if I go like this, you might see me just a tad bit better. So I'll just, I'll just preach from this level, right? I'm just kidding. Pastor Matt is an incredible pastor. Uh, Potter's hand, you are blessed. Amen. He is an incredible pastor. And not only is he an incredible pastor, he's an incredible friend. And um, I, I'm just going to just say this um, as very just honestly and vulnerably as I can. Um, in a community, the Apex is a wonderful community. It's the peak of good living, but it's also the peak of competition. Let's just be honest in this place for a few minutes. It's the peak of competition, and you see it, and, and it's... It's, it's really kind of tiring, to be honest with you. You drive down on a Sunday morning, and you see 17 different church signs out on Highway 55, and, and it's, really, uh, it's really sad because the family of God is not meant to be in competition with one another. We're supposed to be competing against the enemy and not each other. And um, it's wonderful to have been connected with Pastor Matt because uh, there is no competition there. And I find nothing but friendship and love and, and encouragement. And I, I am a better husband. I am a better father. And I am a better pastor because of my friendship with Pastor Matt. And I'm thankful for that. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I really do. And, and I'm just going to be honest with you. Our people, Bridgepoint, are blessed for many reasons to be able to be here and worship with you guys because Potter Hand is a wonderful and beautiful church. And we're thankful for those things. Um, so for instance, I'll show you some blessings that we have. If we weren't here this morning, we would have been in eight degree weather trying to unload a big trailer into Apex Middle School. And, and those, those carts are cold. Yeah, our people are like, praise Jesus. Like they're, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, but also <laughs> on, on top of that, there was no heat there. And, and all this really, we've discussed this for several months coming together and we were going to try to do it in December, but some things happened. And then we're aiming for February. And, and honestly, like when I got the, the first news that Apex was struggling with heat, I texted Pastor Matt and I said, hey man, there's a chance we're just going to show up and just worship with you guys on Sunday because we may not have no heat and I can't do that to our people. You know what I'm saying? So, so don't be surprised. And his response was, this, this would be incredible. It'd be awesome. And then his next thing was, so your people will feel comfortable. Why don't you preach? And man, that's just, the heart of that is just incredible. And so I'm really, really thankful for you. And Amy, you're an incredible wife. I don't even call her Amy anymore. If you know, um, I'm just, I call her Disney because she makes all match dreams come true. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you'll hear, I'm just telling you. I, I'm just like, her nickname is Disney around here. I'm just telling you. So it's just awesome. I'm really, really, really thankful. All right, so we've laughed a little bit. Let's pray, and let's get in God's word. We'll probably laugh a few more times. God, we thank you, Lord, for today. God, we just ask you, Lord, to take this time and connect us to you. God, we pray, Lord, through the power of your spirit that we see, feel, and know that your presence is here and that, God, our lives are changed to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your sermon notes, you can go ahead and pull those sermon notes out. They probably came in your bulletin. If not, you can uh, run to the back and grab one real fast as well. Um, I kind of stay close to the notes so you'll know how long I'm going to preach. And then if you see my wife out of nowhere, just raise her hand. That means land the plane, son. It's time to get out of here. You know what I'm saying? So, so nothing spiritual is really happening. She's just signing to me uh, that it's time to be quiet and get, get on out because Matt's got a reservation at Mexican food. So, and he told me cheese dip on him if you go to the same place. Okay, So here we go. Here's what I found. I found out this life principle, and I'm telling you, I, I just see it more in a play and effect in my life than anybody else's, but I see it all around me. And in your notes, how I phrase the principle is this right here. Everyone is going somewhere, but few people end up somewhere on purpose. They're, everybody's going in some place, in some direction. We're all trying to get somewhere, but, but very few of us very few of us end up somewhere on purpose. Most likely in our life, we have an idea of what we want our dream to be. We have some things that we want to see set out or, or, or want to accomplish or to achieve. 
but very rarely do most people set the plan in their life to make sure that they achieve it. That, that's why at the beginning of the year, there's so many people who make commitments or resolutions on things they were going to try to accomplish and things that they were going to try to achieve. And, and it's because they have an understanding that they want to see something change. But it doesn't change because they're just kind of wandering aloof. They're just trying to get there, and hopefully it just kind of falls in place and just, just, just happens. Here, here's um, some wonderful things I've just found by accident. Now, I found the best donut shop I've ever found in my whole entire life by accident. I was actually getting my daughter some, some clothes for school, and they had to be embroidered. She goes to uh, Pine Springs, and so they have to have a little bit of embroidery going on there. And, and uh, as we were getting embroidered, I saw a sign, and all it said on it was donut. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's a fat man's dream, I'm just going to tell you. And so I saw it, and I was like, I'm going to try this donut place out. It's going to be good. And so one day I snuck over there, and I got this donut. And I'm telling you, these donuts are amazing. It's called the Baker's Dozen. It's just right off of Buck Jones Road, right across from, like, REI. I'm just selling you the, the greatest donut I've ever had. It's just wonderful. And it's so good. And I, but I just stumbled across it. But, but what I have learned is this. Every year I say I'm going to lose weight, and it hasn't happened yet. You know what I'm saying? Like, I haven't achieved that goal. I do good for a week or two, but I don't set a plan in place to where I'm going to actually achieve that dream. And, and so many of us make these resolutions, and if you pay attention, and maybe you just think for just a moment, how many resolutions are the same this year for 2018 that you had listed in 2017? Or, or how about the same one that you had in 2016, 2017, and 2018, but you'll get to it. It just might be 2020, right? You're going to get there eventually, right? But you're not setting a plan. It's because we all are somewhat adopted and adapted to this principle that we're all going somewhere. I'm going to get somewhere, but we don't do it intentionally. Matter of fact, a few verses that I have for you is, is Psalms chapter 39, verse 4 and 5. And David writes this. He says, Lord, remind me of how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away. That human existence is but a breath. Will you do that with me for just a, so, a second? Will you just take a deep breath? I found this really helps a lot. Like if you'll just sit there and at the count three, I'm going to say one, two, three, and everybody just let out like that big like, <sighs> ready to count three, ready, one, two, three, just <sighs> <sighs> life's over. That's what scripture says. It's like one deep breath breath. Now, I saw a lot of men in here. That sounded a lot like a sigh you hear when you don't do your honey-do list, right? Like, you're like, oh, that sounded real familiar. Like, <sighs> that's, or maybe that's just my wife. But, uh, but I'm just telling you, uh, life is so fast. And scripture says it right here that your life is fleeing. And I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but I want to tell you, your life right now, the day you live today brings you one day closer to when your day ends. You were born to die. And every day you live takes you one day closer to that date because your days are numbered. There's a finite number is what this says. There's a day. There's a certain number on the days that you're going to live. I don't know what your number is. I don't know what my number is. And I hope our numbers are a lot larger than what some people might think. But I can tell you that your days are coming to, a, to an end one day. Psalms chapter 90, Moses kind of says it like this when, when he was helping write some of these things. He says, teach us to number our days right that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So what he says is he begins to say this, like, hey, if our days are numbered, then we need to make sure our days count. And like, let's have some wisdom. Now, here's the deal. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Most of us have knowledge. Knowledge is just facts. We just know a lot of things. In the day of Facebook, and the day of Google, we have a lot of random knowledge that takes place, right? Like, we have a, a, an idea of a lot of different things. Matter of fact, I know things that I don't even need to know and that I never put into practice. Matter of fact, I saw a great quote the other day, and it kind of took me by surprise when I first heard it. The quote was this right here, that knowledge is understanding that a tomato is actually a fruit. I didn't know that. I was like, a tomato is a fruit? I like a lot of fruit, and I don't like I like ketchup, but I don't like tomatoes, which is really strange. We can talk about that some other time. But I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, I heard it was a fruit, and that for the first time, I was like, I really love fruit, but I'm not a big tomato fan. Um, so that's kind of strange. I didn't know that. And then the rest of the quote said this, and I thought this was great. Wisdom is realizing that the tomato doesn't, doesn't belong in fruit salad. Ah, that was good, I thought. That's really, really smart to me. Like, it's a fruit, but it doesn't belong in fruit salad because it doesn't mix. It doesn't happen. And that, my friends, is the difference between knowledge 
and wisdom. Because knowledge is knowing something, but wisdom is knowing how to apply it and enact it in your life. And when we write this verse right here, when it talks about let us have wisdom, the Bible says that the wisdom only comes from God. That the only way to receive or get or have wisdom is to have, have a relationship with God. And Proverbs even puts it like this, that the beginning of wisdom is actually the fear of God and knowing who he is. I can't think of a better way to have the best 2018 the best year of your life than making sure that you have and understand what a relationship with Jesus Christ actually is. Now, all of us know that. I mean, all of us in this room would probably say that I know if I had a life or a relationship with Jesus Christ, my life would be better. My life would be good. My life, if I actually did the principles that I've learned and heard most of my life, if I actually put that knowledge into wisdom, which means put it into practice, my life would be better. So if I read my Bible, my life would be better. If I prayed and prayed often, my life would be better. If I fasted and attended church more regularly, if I gave generously, if I did these things, my life would be better better. But how many of us actually put those things into practice? Having the knowledge just isn't enough. Man, I would encourage you this morning to understand and come to the realization that your life and your days are numbered. Matter of fact, I, I, I would even go here. Let me just say it like this. I, you, I believe sometimes, and if you've ever been a part of a 12-step program, you'll, you'll hear some similarities with this thought. But in the program, they say these things like, that's God doing for you what you can't do for yourself. That's a common thing they say in these programs. And the reason why they say that is because you had no control over it. And you know what I believe? I believe this morning, this is a situation where God did for me and Bridgepoint what we could not do for ourselves. And he used Pastor Matt and PH Church to allow it to take place. Because we've talked for months about doing this. We've talked about, I mean, we've met at Dallas Chicken, and we sit there, and we'll eat our breakfast, and we'll talk back and forth, and we'll laugh, and we'll say, we've got to get our people together. If you and I love each other this much, our people are going to love each other this much. It's going to be awesome because our churches are like the culture of who we are. And if I like you and you like me, we've got to get us together. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's do it. Let's do it in December. We put it off. Let's try for January. Let's put it off. Let's do it. All right, February is the month. God's like, nah, I'm going to do for you what you guys won't do for yourselves. I'm going to go ahead and just wipe that heat out real fast. And, and I'm going to make one bald guy call another real fast and <laughs> hook a brother up. You know what I'm saying? Like, and our days are numbered because we'll put it off. And, and man, what a joy it is to be in here together, loving on Jesus with one another, knowing that we're connecting with him and that his presence is here. And what a gift it is to know and it is a gift to know that my days are numbered and I need to make my days count. I need to make them matter. I mean, that's why I've tried so hard to convert Pastor Matt into an Ohio State fan. I want his days when he cheers for college football to actually matter. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't join Coach Satan. That's terrible, right? That's terrible. Join. And Pastor Matt looks at me and says, bro, quit preaching so long. They get Jesus. They know. Stop it. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, I'm telling you, I love, I love knowing that my days are numbered so that I can have wisdom on how to actually use them. Yeah. Let me give you guys some ideas on how and ways to kind of make sure your days are ordered so that way you can use them correctly. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to show you where it says the order matters. Ephesians 5. Verses 15 through 17 say this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Can, can I just tell you right now what the Lord's will is? The Lord's will is for you to be in relationship with him and to lead others to be in relationship with him. There's so many people that say, man, I'm trying to find what God's will is in my life. And you know what? I think you can find it, and you can be, and you need to be intentional about trying to find it. But God's word has already showed us why Christ came. Matter of fact, he says it like this. Jesus said, I came to seek, which means to try to find, and to save the lost. 
And I've come to find that nowadays, a lot of times, we don't know a lot of lost people inside the church, and there's not as many lost people as should be inside the church. There, there should be more. There's, we should be reaching and, and trying to show people who Christ is and, and speak and, and share the love that we have for Christ and, more importantly, the love that Christ has for us. That's what he's called us to do. How can we be wise about our 2018? How can you have the best year yet? You can start sharing the gospel with the people that you know. You can start sharing the love of God with the people that are around you. Man, if you want to have an incredible day, here's what you do. I'm going to tell you, if you want to see God move in your heart and your life, invite somebody to church that doesn't know Jesus and watch Pastor Matt preach and share the gospel. And as he shares the gospel, watch them give their heart to Jesus. There's no better feeling in the world than to know that God has changed somebody that you love, somebody that you know's life. Man, it's a beautiful thing. If that happened for everyone in this room in 2018, that in itself might make it the best year of your life. But you have to come to the understanding of a few things. Number one is this right here. You have a limited amount of time. We've talked about this before, but James 4, 13 through 14 says this. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, we'll spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So I have a, a three-year-old daughter. My three-year-old daughter's name's Gwen. She is currently uh, wreaking havoc probably behind us in this wall right here. She is the poster child, God love her, of life, but also of A-D-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-
I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it the next day. You, you'll come in contact or you'll sit next to somebody at your work that you've known for years that you need to share your faith with or that you need to share love with or you need to be good to. Most of us in this room, even your coworker, you have a neighbor that you've been next to for years that you don't even know their name. And God's placed you. you. It's not by chance that you live in the home that you live. It's not by chance that you, live, you work in the work that you're at. Because your life is like a mist. God is more intentional than that. But if we continue to live our lives as if like we're always going to have tomorrow, James tell us that your life is like a mist. Look at that. There goes Tommy. He's gone. There goes Pastor Matt. His life is gone. There goes your life gone. And before you know it, it's over. And I don't want to be sad and make you think about death so much, but I do want you to come to the reality and the understanding that your days are numbered, and we have to be intentional enough to quit doing and putting off the things that God has called us to do and do them now. Now, because our time is limited. Number two, if you do this and, and, and realize this, you You'll see this, but uh, I've noticed a lot of people have a problem and don't understand that, number two, you cannot do everything. You cannot do everything. In today's society, man, our badge of honor is this right here, and, and we don't even notice it anymore. But when I say, hey, how are you doing? The, most, the biggest answer, the most used answer is, is, man, my life is busy. I'm busy. And we wear it like a badge of honor. And then we start talking about, I'm working 40 hours, 60 hours, 80 hours. I have a part-time job, and they're working me 48 hours. I'm just tired. I'm busy. How am I doing that? I'm, I'm PTA with my school. And not only do I help with the PTA, but I help with carpool. And then not only carpool, but I'm fixing dinner with the Instapot. And Instapot's the new heaven, in case you don't know. But to keep going, man, I'm just telling you, like, everybody says all this stuff that they have to do. Hey, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. And we have... Uh, unlimited amount of time and we act as if we have that un unlimited amount of time to be able to accomplish all the different things that we're trying to accomplish man it's funny because I, last time i checked scripture point blank tells us our days are numbered and our time is limited and the truth is you have to be more intentional about what you do and then it says you cannot do everything proverbs 17 24 in the good news version says it this way an intelligent person aims at wise action but a fool starts off in many directions. The Bible tells us point blank in the book of wisdom. It says, hey, if you want to do the wise thing, you'll do a wise action. You'll pay attention. You'll know. You'll make a smart decision. And you'll make a smart move. But you won't find yourself going so many different places at once. Number three, I would tell you, is this right here. Not only is your time limited, not only do you, you got to be selective about what you do, but number three, there is a cumulative value to investing small amounts of time in certain activities over a long period. Man, can I tell you something? I, 2018 is going to be the best year of my life until 2019. 2018 is going to be the best year of my life. And this is why I know it, because there is a goal I've been trying to achieve for about five or six years that I've actually, I'm getting really close to. I'm getting very, very close to. Uh, about three years ago, I challenged myself, and I ran a f my first 5K. You know what I'm saying? I ran it with a close friend, and he outran me, and I've been bitter ever since, so I went back into depression for a little bit. And, but I'm going to tell you this. I, I decided I'm not going to stop at a 5K. I'm going to run a 10K. And so I've been working up to try to run on that 10K. As a matter of fact, the other day, uh, last week, there was three times last week where I ran five miles, and that five miles was like a goal for me. I'm going to run Five miles. Five miles without stop. Now, I look like death afterwards. Get me, hear me? And I wish I had hair to kind of hold back some of the sweat because I looked like I just jumped in a pool. But I'm telling you, when I finished that five miles, I screenshotted that baby and I sent it to my wife and I thought, she's going to be so impressed. You know what I'm saying? And she wrote back, that's really good, honey. <laughs> Actually, she didn't. I'm just teasing. She wrote back and said, you're my man. You go, boy. I said, Quit talking like that, honey. You know, <laughs> we'll have baby number three for you. Know, you know what I'm saying? You got to quit doing that. So you got to quit that. You know, don't do that to me. But man, I, I'll laugh forever in a day because I, I, it's a goal that I, I, I've had, but it, that goal didn't come just like running and getting on a treadmill or trying to run it all in one day. Matter of fact, I remember when I first got up to two miles, and it took several weeks for me to get where I just ran, completely ran two miles. 
And I was sitting there as I was running through it, and I thought to myself, this is crazy. Like, what am I trying to accomplish? Because I am about to die at two miles. But the next couple weeks, I just kept at it, running the same amount. And all of a sudden, three miles got to be a little easier. And all of a sudden, four miles got to be amazing. And I was just on cloud nine. And I just knew I was going to make it, but I didn't stop at two. I didn't stop at two and a half. I didn't stop at three. I had to continuously work to get to where I'm at five miles. Now, I am still exactly 1.2 miles away from my 10K, and it will happen. You know why? Because I will not stop (laughs) until I get there. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to get there tomorrow, but I have to continuously keep on the journey to get where I want to go. Why? Because there is a cumulative value when you do small things over and over and over again without stopping. That's why so many people who make the resolution to lose weight, they mess up. Because you go three days, you eat cardboard, right? You give up carbs for cardboard. And you ate chicken, and you had chicken. And then you had chicken, you know what I'm saying? Like... And you go to the mirror and you still look like you haven't lost any weight at all. And you're like, man, my chin is still the same. I still feel a little bit heavy in these clothes. I just want a piece of pie. And if I'm going to look like I ate pie, I might as well go ahead and eat some pie. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what happens. Maybe it's just me. That's how I talk to myself. I'm like, man, that roll looks like I had chocolate cake. Why am I not eating chocolate cake? And I go back and look at the cardboard and I'm like, this is terrible. No carbs, cardboard. This is horrible. Why am I going through this? And the truth of the matter is, is it won't change until you do a cumulative thing over many, many, many times. Because those that stay on the path and stay on the journey of doing the small things over and over and over again achieve what it is they're trying to accomplish. There's a value to it. Matter of fact, Proverbs 13, 11 says it like this, and it uses the analogy of money. It says, whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Man, I love that idea that if we are intentional, especially when it comes to our finances, that if we gather it little by little, it actually grows to where it's supposed to be. Man, I just would encourage you to think about the small steps that you should be taking to achieve what you want to achieve in 2018 to make it the best year ever. Number four, and close to the end, is this right here. You have to decide what is most important and then manage it daily. So you need to go back and remind yourself of what it is that you want to accomplish and realize you can't do everything and then attack it by managing it daily. You have to decide. Proverbs 21.5 says it like this. Careful planning puts you ahead in the long run. Hurry and scurry puts you farther behind. When I look at somebody that I know who has a dream or has something they want to accomplish and their constant answer to me is that they're in a hurry, they never have enough time, I understand and know at that moment that their dream is farther away than what they realize. And the reason is is because they're trying to hurry and scurry, and they think it's going to happen quickly. But you know what? The truth is they're only pushing it farther away because they're not taking intentional steps to make it happen. I started off telling you guys what the most important thing was, and I've come to this idea and this conclusion that there are steps and there are ways, there are smart, intelligent, intentional ways to accomplish what it is you want to in 2018. But the whole title of this is First Things First. And I believe there's an order to things. And I believe all the resolutions and all the commitments you make are all good. I want you to hear my heart in that. I I think they're good. I think they're stuff that you should want to accomplish. I think they're things that you know you need to do because you have the knowledge of your life better than anyone else of what's going to help it and make it better. But you know there's an order to these things. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up and help me with this part. In Matthew, the Bible says this, Matthew 6, 33. It says, but seek first his kingdom. See, we can do all these other things, but your life in 2018 is not going to be the best year of your life unless the first thing you do is make sure you put God's kingdom first. And I mean this about all things. I mean in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we're in relationship with him. I mean in the way that we pray, the way that we read his word, in the way that we give, in the way that we attend, in the way that we put in place the, the, the idea that God is first in our life. Can I just tell you this? I, I get tired these days of, of watching things that, that I used to watch all the time. Matter of fact, I used to watch things like the Oscars, and I used to watch things like the Grammys on TV, and, and I get tired of it because this is what I see all the time. I see people stand up who are blessed with a gift and with a reward, and they get awarded for that gift that they have, 
And they stand up there, and this is the first thing they say every single time. I want to thank God. I want to thank God. But nothing in their life shows that God is the first thing in their life. But here's the problem. That's soaked into the church. Because most people who've grown up in church or knows who Christ is or, or who's tried to develop a relationship with him, if you ask them and you say to them, hey, what's your number one? The first thing they say is God. And you know why they say that? Because they have the knowledge to understand that he should be first. The problem in most churches, and I'll just speak about Bridgepoint, is that we don't use the wisdom to live our lives as if he really was number one. Because you know what? If he was number one, if he really was first, then we would understand the next part of this verse. Because the next part of this verse goes on to say that basically that we should seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You know what it means by his righteousness? It means his way of living. Basically, what he's telling us in Matthew is this, is that the first thing in order for our lives to be the best that they can be, to be who we were called to be, is to know that we need to seek after him and then the way that he shows us in his word to actually live. And let's be honest, I struggle. I mean, I went to Bible school, I've got my degree in Bible and theology, and, and I'm just one of those people, I have to be honest, I struggle sometimes living the way the Word of God tells me to live. But here's the difference. I am at least going to try and apply and push that into my life. And that there is the difference between those who seek God first and His righteousness and then those who don't. It's not the fact that they don't know. It's the fact, are you really going to try? Are you really going to try? Are you really going to make sure that 2018 is the best year of your life because you're going to seek after God's kingdom? You're going to attend church more than you've ever attended. You're going to join a small group and, and, and be faithful in that group and attend and be a part. You're going you're to give like you've never given before because you know that God calls us to give generously. You're going to participate in friendships and relationships and outreaches, and you're going to be involved and a part because you know that you're seeking first the kingdom of God. Are you going to take it even one step deeper and farther and you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to start trying to apply God's principles to our, my life. I'm going to start listening to what Pastor Matt and Pastor Tommy say and show me in God's word. I'm just going to be a hearer of the word, as James says, but actually a doer of God's word. I am going to jump all in and I'm going to participate. Because here's what I know and this is what I've seen and this is one reason why Pastor Matt and I get along so well is that we're not in competition with one another. But what we want to see is God in the lives of the people of Apex, North Carolina. Because if God can use Potter's Hand and if God can use Bridgepoint to change the lives of the people who attend, that it's going to affect the people who don't attend. Because if we get it together, if we seek God first, if we apply his principles and his, li his, his Bible, his word to our life, then it's going to affect those of us around us. Why? Because when our life changes, those lives of the people around us begin to change. And man, what a beautiful thought it is to know that if PH and BP would come together and say to one another, encourage one another to live the life, to seek God's kingdom and live the way that God's called us to through his word, that we can encourage one another to continue to do what God has called us to do. What could God do in the city of Apex, North Carolina, or Cary, or Holly Springs, or Fuquay, or Morrisville? What could God do? If God can take 12, 12 men, he didn't even use his best thing, women. He used 12 men. And he could, the Bible say, turn the world upside down. Turn the world upside down. What could he do with the 250 plus that call PH and BP home? What does it take? I've got to seek God's kingdom first. And I have to apply his word to my life. And I will have and those around me will have the best year of their life. Will you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? This morning, I want to say a word of prayer. And as I close this prayer, then we'll have an action. But I just want you to hear God's word. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things, all those other things 
shall be added unto you. God, I pray, Lord, for the hearts of our people. God, it's been our prayer to come together in unity as one. And God, it's been our prayer that, God, you would use us for your calling, for your giftedness. God, to reach those that need you. And God, we can only reach those if we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, if we apply those things through wisdom. So God, I pray, Lord, for more wisdom for our people. God, I come to you and I ask you to give our people more wisdom. Let them not only have knowledge, but let them understand and know and hear how to apply the things that they know to their life so that they can see life change in them and those around them. And God, we give you all the glory and all the praise for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Matt to join me up here. I'm going to ask everyone to stand in this room with me real quickly. Pastor Matt and I discussed this, and we figured, hey, we're going to go all out. What is the best way to kind of get people to seek God's kingdom together? Mm -hmm. And one thing that we came up with was this. We're going to invite everyone in this room, if you feel comfortable, to come to this altar, to come to the front, and take the next few moments, the next few minutes, as the worship team plays and sings, to seek God's kingdom, to ask him to show you and remind you that your days are numbered, to ask him to show you what it is he wants you to accomplish with the days that each of us have left, to ask him to give us wisdom on how to apply those things to our Amen. life, but to allow us to know that Jesus is first of all. And so we want to take this moment and ask you to come and join us up here and pray as they lead. And then at the end, Pastor Matt will take over and dismiss us. Amen. Join us at the altar. Let's pray together.